Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and Visa. And I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Stephen Bond, with us on the ones and twos like he is with each and every episode. And if you want to tweet at us, you can find Michael at M Lombardi NFL at Femi Abebefe is where you can find me. Michael, we saw another Sunday in the oh National God. Football League. I told you before we started this thing, up is down, down is up, and it started on Sunday night. With the Pittsburgh I mean, Steelers I want and Miami you, Dolphins. I want you to be as aggressive to me as you are on your tweets. I mm-hmm. see you getting giving shit out on your tweets. Oh, so yeah. I want you to hit me with some of that. I can't be the only guy who's screaming and yelling about this. Like, oh, this they, is absurd. They got, they, they're coming after me, Michael. We'll get into that later. But you were saying. I mean, this is absurd what we're watching. We're watching the deconstruction of football. And tell, we are no longer about strategy. You know, the, the, the most appealing thing to me about football is, the, is it's chess on grass. It's the strategy. It's the understanding of what's happening. It's how do we relate to the game, what moves have to make based on the game. And now we are starting – now we're getting people who are playing checkers, and it's really embarrassing. It, it really is. What Mike McDaniels did – and I, I want to ask you this in all sincerity. I, I have nothing against Mike McDaniels. Everything I say on this podcast – has no grain of hatred towards anybody. Mm-hmm. I don't. I'm just trying to bring out what is, to me, the the variable. I don't need – see, I'm different than most everybody who's on television. I don't need them to tell me what they're seeing. Like, Chris goes into Miami, and he needs to rely on his relationships for them to tell him what's going on. I don't. I, I can watch the tape myself. I don't need them to tell me. I don't need to go into the Chargers and have Brendan Staley tell me what he's doing, who's playing good, who's not playing. You know, I'll just watch the tape and give you my opinion. So I'm going to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. If Mike McDaniels is this – and that's all I ever hear about. Mike McDaniels is a genius. And I'm sure at Yale he's really good. And I'm sure that if I was in school, I would sit next to him to cheat off of him. I promise you. (laughs) I would have moseyed over there and been able to look at his paper. I got that. I could figure out who's (laughs) smart, you know, when I was at Hofstra. But I'd like you, Femi, to tell me, give me three examples of what makes Mike McDaniels a genius as it relates to football. I'll wait. I mean, I'm going to be at a loss for words because I can't give you that three. And, and I've, I've been indifferent about Mike McDaniel, but I'm not sure I can give you three examples as to why he gets the quote unquote genius label. Well, well let's OK, let's tear it. But let's break it down last night. He's in a 16. He comes out in the first quarter. He has 10 first downs in the first quarter. Moves the ball effortlessly. They have to settle for a couple field goals or else the game gets blown away. And all of a sudden, Pittsburgh starts coming back. They make adjustments to what Miami's doing. At the end of the half, Tua almost throws an interception. Yep. Sutton drops that ball. He kicks a field goal to go up six. Okay, great. Now, during that drive, he used none of his timeouts. He let just plays come right off the clock, right? You saw it just winding down, okay? Goes in at halftime up 16 to 10. Comes out, he starts the second half. He's got a, a third and two, he calls a run that loses a yard. He hurries up to the line of scrimmage, and instead of taking a two-score lead against a quarterback that's a rookie that's struggling, and meanwhile, I'm watching the game, and Tua is trying to throw interceptions to the other team, trying, at least four. I think you could say he threw five last night. And yet you turn down points. And what does yeah. what in that equation makes you smart? He's he's trying to outthink the room. They even said on the broadcast or like the the models and all the fourth down models said that kicking the field goal was the best decision to do in that spot because six plus three equals nine. And last time I checked, a nine point game is a two possession game in football, and you're going to be against an offense that's struggling, and he decided that. Let's go ahead and run it right into the teeth of the Steelers' defense, which was the only successful thing they had going for them right there in that right. game. All right, so if we make it 19. Now, 19, okay, here's what he scored. 19, if he would have gotten to 19 points, that would have been his third highest, his third highest offensive production for the season, okay? So he's, he's the head coach of this football team. He understands where he is. He's had six games. Now, he hasn't had his quarterback for two of them, or two and th- through two and three quarters of them, but he's watched all six games. Outside of the fourth quarter against Baltimore, outside of that game, he has scored 20 against New England, 10 of which came against New England. Def- offense gave him those points. His defense scored 10. 
He scored 21 against Buffalo. Six of those or seven of those came when they got the ball on the six-yard line. He scored 15, 17, and 16. If he kicks it to 19, now that's the third highest out point he would have had as a head coach. And yet he stubs his nose at it. And instead of going crazy, I mean, to me, I say this. My man Bill Berman sitting in the office next to me, he tweeted this out. Like, I think it's really, if I were in the analytical community, if I were a member of the analytical community, I would be going nuts for these guys giving analytics a bad name. It, it really was a disgraceful decision, to be to be honest. I, and I think everybody, I was following along with the game on Twitter like most people do when they watch these primetime games, and every single person, whether it was from the analytical community or from the just the traditional community or whatever, everyone said, well, "Why are you not? Why are you not taking the three points right there?" And yes, it's not a one hundred percent guarantee that the field goal kicker would make it, but it's a better decision to try to go up nine than to keep Pittsburgh into this game. That game had no business being a one possession game. I bet on Pittsburgh, so I was happy that he made that decision to to, to 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 go ahead and go for it on the fourth down. But that had no business being a 16 to 10 game throughout that entire second half. The Steelers defense, kudos to them for keeping him into that football game. But Mike McDaniel was just as much of one of the reasons why the Pittsburgh Steelers were still in that game. No, no doubt. And, and, and let's put it, let's, let's put another spin on it. Where was Mike McDaniel's adjustments after the first quarter? Once Pittsburgh decided to carry the routes, once, I mean, the only really play they made was the second drive, the first drive of the second half where the corner was reading the quarterback's eyes and he mm -hmm. jumped on the flat and they got that in cut inside. I mean, and then they corrected him and said, forget reading the eyes, just stay with your guy. Stay with the guy you got. He won't be able. He's the last play of the game, the third down boot to his left, that throw, which should have been intercepted, has to be one of the worst throws you'll see out of a quarterback. Look, I'm not a Tua hater. I don't think Tua was the fifth pick of the draft. I don't think tanking for Tua was a smart play. I said it back then. I think Tua is a very average quarterback. And as much skill as they put around them, and they have a lot of skill around them, they can't score any points even with them. They can't. I just cited it. I mean, they had one game where they scored points. Like, at some point, don't you strategize the chess match? Okay, I'm playing Tomlin. He's conservative. I know what he's going to do. He's got a rookie quarterback. I mean, they can't score any points. They're not going to score a lot of points against us unless we give up a big play. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, points per play, uh, uh, Pittsburgh averaged 0.14, and, and the genius averaged 0.25. That's points per play. I mean, it, it's absurd. Points per possession was even worse. I mean, points per possession, they had 1.33. And, and, and Pittsburgh had 083. So you're playing a team that's telling you we can't score. Pittsburgh averaged 4.9 yards per play. Okay, so why would I not take three? It would have been it, again. I can't score points. You have full agreement for me here. I, I think that he should have kicked that field goal there, and I'm glad he didn't because I was able to win money off uh, me of that too. stupid decision. I'm I mean, very, it, I'm very it gave me a it. it gave me a three and zero week on my Bill <laughs> yeah, AD picks. I mean, go. I was happier in hell. I mean, you know, I had Cleveland, which was I was I had Cleveland and laid the six and a half. I was happy as shit on that. And then I had who else did I have? I had uh, Cleveland. I had Pittsburgh, and oh, I had the Jets. So I had those three. I gave out on my show Sunday there morning, but. To me, it, 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 this lack of strategy, I, I, I really believe this. I think, I, I think the Daily Coach, we should do this. I think we should hold a seminar in Atlanta <laughs> and charge significant money and have coaches come in and try to teach what it takes to be a head coach. Because we don't have, we're, it, it is becoming a lost art. And the guys that do it, the Pete Carrolls, the Bill Belichicks, the Mike Vrabels, they're the guys winning. They're the guys winning. Mm -hmm. The guys that just look – Andy Reid. They're the guys winning. The guys that just look at their play sheet and, and don't play complimentary football and, and are not watching the game. We'll get to LaFuck later. But are not watching the same game you and I are watching. They're losing. I mean, I'm, I'm all over Salai. I, I, I've been giving him crap. But the one thing he's done in this four-game win streak is he said, you know what, Zach Wilson, you're not going to beat me. You're, you're going to stand over there and we're going to punt. <laughs> Right? Yeah. <laughs> You're not, that's funny. That's a good way to put it. We'll get into the Jets and all that stuff later. But, Michael, I want to talk to you about a team that took money out of my pocket yesterday, and that was the Kansas City Chiefs. They defeated the San Francisco 49ers 44 
to 23. An offensive explosion from this Chiefs team. They're 529 total yards, 9.1 yards per play. How impressed with you with uh, Kansas City going ahead and taking off, uh, dominating, I should say, the San Francisco 49ers yesterday afternoon? I mean, they had 10 punts, never punted to the fourth quarter. They had 17 plays in the fourth quarter, scored 14 points. Basically, they only had nine third downs in the game. They were six for nine on third down, mm-hmm. okay? They were four for five in the red zone. They were, they were three for three in goal to go. They missed a field goal at the end of the half, and then they scored to start the half. They would have won the middle eight. They, they did win the middle eight in essence, right? They made explosive plays, and I, I've, I've sat there and said, well, wait a minute. I love San Francisco's defense. I thought that this could carry them. And all of a sudden, you know, what I think happened is as good as D'Amico Ryans has been coaching, mm-hmm. there's a certain way you have to play the Chiefs. Thank you. Like, there's a certain way you got to play them, and that's not the way, right? Thank Again, you. we're back into the strategy of the game. Like, I don't understand, Femi. It's driving me crazy. I didn't get it. Like, why don't we sit there? Why does why don't they sit there before the week starts and and have a meeting with the coordinators and say how do we have to play the game to win? What do we have to do to win this game? And, and nobody's doing it. I mean, Kansas City understands it. They got Mahomes. I mean, Kansas City averaged four point four points per drive. Okay, that's, I mean, San Francisco averaged two point oh nine. I mean, think about this. Points per play, Kansas City was at 0.75. And I think San Francisco has an elite defense. It's I I did not, and I even tweeted about it. I said, imagine playing zone coverage against the 2022 Kansas City Chiefs. We saw the recipe that's been outlined there against the Chiefs. If you play man coverage, their wide receivers have struggled to beat man coverage. They've been getting much less separation this year than they were last year when Tyreek Hill was scaring the living daylights out of everybody. Why do you think the Niners just went to playing a little bit more zone? Because we've seen the what works in defending this team. The Raiders don't have better personnel than San Francisco, and yet the Raiders gave the Chiefs a lot more trouble. And I get it's a division game or whatever, but still, the recipe is out there. Why deviate from it? Well, because what happens is when you become a, a complete team, to me the best defensive teams in football are, are these teams. They play 33% zone. They play 33% man. And they play 33% man zone dogs. Okay. When you become just a zone team only and very, very little man, you better be really good. You better be Nolan Ryan throwing 109 at the end of your career. You better be really good at that, right? You better be really, really good. And if you don't alter what you're doing in terms of the game plan based on what you have to do to take the team out, see, this is what happens. When you look at your schedule, at the beginning of the season, and you're a head coach of the National Football League, you have to decide, okay, we know we're playing, you're playing Phil. Say I'm the head coach of the Lions, and I know I'm going to play Philadelphia. It's on the schedule. Well, i got to spend OTA days. i got to spend at least 10 days in training camp practicing against the Eagles offense. i got to. Okay? I also have to practice against what Aaron Rodgers does. Like, these are the things we've got to get better at in these categories. And, and nobody's do. We we no longer have head coaches. We no longer have how to prepare a team. We don't have that. And then so what's happening is we're blaming the players. We'll get to Brady and Rodgers, but a lot of the Brady and Rodgers problems are team our team design. Remember in football, there's two elements that happen. It's either production or design. Okay, it's either production or design. If the if the design's good and we're not getting plays out of the players, then that's the production. If the design's shitty, don't blame the players. What about the Niners offensively? Because as somebody who bet on San Francisco, I thought they had a chance toward the end of that half to really grab hold of that game. Garoppolo throws the interception right there at the goal line when he had Jeff Wilson open there on that route underneath. Uh, what did you make of what San Francisco was doing offensively yesterday? Well, I think you got to, you know, to me, you can't turn the ball over against them, right? And, and and even though they did, they turned it over three times, they got two turnovers out of Mahomes, right? But I never felt like they were in control of the game. Look, Garoppolo can't turn the ball over if they're going to win. I mean, San Francisco's mm-hmm. had seven turnovers in the last three weeks. I mean, they've had seven turnovers in the last – they That's had three pathetic. against Atlanta, they had three. I mean, th- I mean, if you're Kyle Shanahan, you're playing the Rams, right? we got to win this game. we got to get the four and four before the bye. But we're going to play it so that we're not going to turn this ball over. We can't. We cannot risk turning it over. Mm-hmm. Our margin for error, we went all in. 
and we can. And Garoppolo can't turn it over. We can't fumble like we've done. But at the end of the day, I mean, you can't give up. I mean, you can't give up 529 yards. You can't give up 417 yards passing. I think D'Amico Ryans, I think he'll learn from this game. Yeah. But again, this is a lesson. If he wants to become a head coach, there's a style you got to play. You can't sit there and say, we're going to do what we do. You can't. Or else you're going to find somebody who does it better than you. I 100% agree. We saw it last week. The Buffalo Bills have been playing a lot of zone coverage this season. Leslie Frazier said, hey, guess what? We're going to scrap that game plan. We're going to play a lot more man coverage against Kansas City because they can't beat man coverage. They don't have the wide receivers capable of beating man coverage as currently constructed. I don't know why the Niners didn't go ahead and try to replicate that game plan and make the Chiefs earn it and have to actually prove that they can beat it. They went with something else, and the something else put up 44 on their head yesterday afternoon. Michael, let's get to the New York Giants because I tell you what, Michael, Giants fans, they're not happy with me. I don't know if they've been in your mentions as well because we've been kind of giving this team a little bit of issues along the way here, but they get another victory yesterday afternoon, 23-17. to I bet on this team. I won money, and they're still getting at me all mad and stuff. But 23-17, another fourth-quarter performance from Brian Dable, that coaching staff, as they're now 6-1 and one on the season. I mean, they prove the point, Femi, that if you have a really good coach who's managing the quarterback and they're, you're really good situationally football, on, on football situations, and they are, Sir Dwink Martindale, they're good on third down. You know, they're really good in the fourth quarter. If you're good in those areas and you can stay in the game and the opponent isn't aware that you're really good in these areas and they kind of neglect it like the, like the Jacksonville Jaguars did, I mean – you, you, you got a chance to win games. It just proves the point that if you avoid losing, you can win. Mm-hmm. And, 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 I, and I have said this. Look, do I think the Giants are the most talented team? No. But I think ultimately what you see from the Giants is when you have good coaching, good offensive coaching, good defensive coaching, you can compensate for it. You know, this was one of the biggest dilemmas that I had when I was at the Raiders is, is Al loved – I'll believe the game was players. And I believe that too. But to me, the game transition from players to coaches and scheme and development and situational football, the 60s didn't have that. So you could have a lot of great players and dominate the game. In football today, you have to have great players, but you also got to manage the game correctly and be good in situations. And the Giants speak volumes to that. I mean, they speak volumes to that. I mean, look, the, that game, again, uh, my man Doug Peterson. I mean, how many times do we have to talk about this guy, right? Super like, Bowl Doug. I, I mean, at some point, nobody wants to – nobody – you know, he won a Super Bowl. I, I, I think we're seeing that the Eagles organization won a Super Bowl, right? Okay, <laughs> we're seeing that. And, and the fact is he continues to go for it on fourth down. He continues to give games away. He turns down a chance to go up 20 to 13 in the fourth quarter. Now, Dayball turned it down at fourth and two at his own goal line, which Mm -hmm. was a mistake, too. He should have just kicked the points at 17 16 if he gets there, right? He turned it down. But the fourth quarter, Jacksonville has 25 plays, one turnover. They get no points. They get nine first downs. He never gave himself a chance to win. And so he loses the game. He couldn't stop him, he can't get off the field on third down. I mean, the defense gave up 436 yards. I mean, they couldn't stop Barkley from running the ball. Is he watching the same game I'm watching? I mean, this is a game that had he had 430, 52 yards. They had 436. Like, take the points. Everybody's scoring. Are the Giants a good team or a well-coached team or both? Well, I think you can't say they're not good because they win situational football, right? I mean, you know, they went, you know, they were, they were, the Giants were six for 12 on third down yesterday. They're 50%, you know, and they were able to turn the ball over on fourth down. They were able to play good in the situation and they played good in the red zone. I mean, you know, red zone, they were really good. And so, you know, when you look at their team, they're able to make the plays they have to make. So you can't say they're just lucky. Like they're good in the red zone. And so they hold you to field goals. They're the 12th best red zone defense in football. I mean, excuse me. No, they're they're better than that. That they're they're way better than that. I think they're like the fourth best red zone team in football. I'll, I'll wait a minute. Hold on. Let me check. It was fourth going into the season. It is. It's fourth now. They're still the fourth best. They're the sixth best third down team. 
Yeah, maybe. And so they're good in those situations. They get off the field on third down. You can't score touchdowns. They stay attached to you the whole time. And when you turn down points, you're doing them a favor. If you turn – now, Doug Peterson's team was 22nd on fourth down. Like, at some point, when does he figure out that maybe I shouldn't do this? You know, ATN fumbles going – they couldn't stop ATN. ATN fumbles. He's got the ball in the red zone. They turn it over. So when you look at the turnover sheet, it's a, you look at the turnover sheet, you see, well, they really only had one fumble, yada, yada, yada. No, I mean, the fourth down play was a turnover. And that fumble was, yeah, like heading into the end zone, so that takes even more points off the board. Jags, seven yards per play, and they end up losing the football game. But, Michael, let's take our first break on the other side. we got to talk about Brady and Rodgers, two teams we thought would be contenders this year who are in a world of hurt. This is the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi. All right, Michael, yesterday we saw a couple of contenders fall below 500, which is pretty remarkable to see. We'll start here with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They lose as 13-point favorites to the Carolina Panthers, 21-3, to an absolutely ugly performance by the Bucs here. What is the issue? We've talked about this team and some of their struggles. You mentioned how Brady doesn't have the kind of the pass catchers that he would prefer over the middle, but it feels like there has to be more at play here to lose to the P.J. Walker-led Panthers. Uh, look, don't, hey, don't, don't be talking bad about P.J. Walker now. <laughs> I mean, I'll come after your ass, Femi. <laughs> P.J. Walker, I mean, threw, I mean <laughs> P.J. Walker was the first time this year Carolina actually got quarterback play. The very first time. He threw the first touchdown pass to D.J. Moore was outstanding. Okay, he throws mm-hmm. a touchdown pass to Tommy Tremble. That's that as was, good as it gets. That was the one that was good. Yeah, the Tremble one. I like. He that. made a the first play of the game. He he makes a great throw. I think Marshall dropped it, but he. I mean, that's another great throw that didn't get counted in there. You know, I mean, he was sensation. He threw the ball well. They ran it. They were in control of this game from the moment Mike Evans dropped the ball. Mm-hmm. I think this. I think with Carol. I think the problem fundamentally the problem with Tampa is. You can run the ball on Tampa. It used to be you could never run the ball on Tampa. And now you can. I mean, they ran for 173 yards. I mean, Foreman took his outside zone play and took it 60 yards. The next play, Chuba Hubbard takes the same play and cuts it back and walks in the They had three-play drive, 77-yard touchdown. Three-play drive. You can run the ball on them. And then because Brady can't convert third downs, Brady was 2-for-12 on third down. 2-for-12. Oh. I mean, he can't convert third downs. They have no running game to balance it off. Again, he's throwing at 50 times. They average 4.9 yards per play. 4.9 yards per play. Think about this. At Carolina averaged 6.9 yards per play. Carolina averaged 2.1 points per drive. <laughs> and the Bucks averaged 0.27 per drive. I mean... It wasn't a close game. 21-3 to really wasn't an indication of how, how it was. Carolina's defense dominated the game, and they didn't get pressure, and they didn't really hit Brady that much. They did. I think they had one sack in the game. They had one sack for 14 yards, and they had three tackles for losses. That's all they had. I mean, it was con- – and so the, to me, when I watched Tampa Bay, uh, all of this, this to me is a design problem, okay? It's not, it, it is not a, a, an execution problem. It's a design problem. It's not a production problem. So the design of the offense is wrong. Brady needs inside receivers. He needs a nickel running back. He needs a tight end that can catch the ball and win on third down. And he needs a slot receiver. And when you don't, when he doesn't have any of those three, people are going to say he should have retired. When he's throwing the ball as good as ever. But you, if you don't adjust the offense, see, here's to me the two things that I think stand out about Green Bay and Tampa is Tampa doesn't bring the same team back. They try to run the same offense. doesn't work. Green Bay doesn't bring the same team back and tries to run their same offense, and it clearly doesn't work. At some point in the offseason, if you're the head coach, you say to yourself, okay, we don't have the same team. What are we going to do? All right, you go into the season. And then after week three, week four, you say, okay, here's where we are, fellas. We're not very good. We're not going to – Here's what we need to do. Here's what we got to become offensively and defensively. And we'll get better at it. I mean, the Steelers are the perfect. They're as bad as you can be on defense, and they keep getting better at it. Tennessee is one of the, to me, Tennessee is horrendous 
<laughs> their talent level. For them to win games, they shut out Indianapolis twice in the first half, two times in the first half. I mean, but Vrabel knows who he is. He plays to his strengths uh. and, and doesn't get – but this is what's happening. You mentioned the Bucks' design problem, and Byron Leftwich, he's been the offensive coordinator there, and they wanted to kind of run that same offense they've been running the past couple of years with Brady. It almost feels like they tried to run the football early on in the season, and they can't run the ball. Yesterday, 16 yeah. carries, 46 yards. And I know Carolina's defense is good, and we've talked about Carolina's defense on this podcast being like the shining light of this team, but 2.9 yards per carry, and the offensive line issues up front, the injuries, even with all that baked in there, that's pathetic. It really is. And, 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 and two, you know, you, when, when I saw design, it, a lot of it is how do we change and adapt the run game? How do we change and adapt the passing game to what we have to do? Like, you know, just because we have Tom Brady doesn't mean we could just roll the ball out there and we're going to dominate. Like, you got to give Brady the players around him that fit what he does, the throws he makes. You know, it's, it's, a, design, it's a design problem at plays, but it's also a design problem from the GM chair. Like, who are we? What do we need? What highlights Brady's skill set? I mean, think about this. The Giants, once again yesterday, made no explosive plays in the passing game. I think they had a 32-yard. That was a touchdown throw Daniel Jones makes over in the corner. But they're not worried about making explosive plays. They're not asking Daniel Jones to throw it up the field. They know the strength of him is to throw short passes, get the ball of his hand quick. Mm -hmm. So they're adding, they add the element to that. But what's so hard about it? Like, if you're Jason Light and you're sitting there, you got to say to yourself, okay, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to have to find a slot. I got to find a time. We got to get a nickel back somewhere. Like, Brady can't live without Shane Vereen. He can't live without James White. He can't live without uh, Kevin Falk. He needs that guy. They tried to find a slot receiver in Cole Beasley. He ended up retiring, walking away from the game. I don't know who else is out there from a slot receiver perspective, but it's bad. And it's so bad, Michael, that this is the first time since 2002 that Tom Brady has been below 500 this late into the season. Is it How about this, Femi? How about this? In the fourth quarter yesterday, they had 21 plays. He had five first downs and did get a point. Wow. Five first downs and did get a point. I mean, think about that. Like, like it didn't like the – as the game went on, you kept waiting for – and I was on – you know, when I do Chris Russo on Friday, I took the – I was like, okay, the Bucs, they, they should cover – I mean – Carolina, that have, how are they going to move the ball? Mm -hmm. But what I miscalculated about the handicap of this game was how Carolina ran the ball. Mm -hmm. They ran this football down their throat. And if you're, if you're Tampa Bay and you want to play the way you play on defense, if you don't stop the run, you can't play the way you want to play on defense. Well, I mean, think about this, Fem. They got the Ravens this week yeah, on Thursday night. <laughs> then, they got the, then they go out and play the Rams, and then they play Seattle. And, and they got three home games. I mean, against three teams, that can they beat them? Well, good thing you got Lamar Jackson coming to town if you can't stop the run. <laughs> that's going to that's gonna be a tough one on a short week, Thursday Night Football on Amazon Prime. But uh, it's going to be a long week, Michael, once again in Green Bay. The Packers now falling to 3-4 and four after losing to the Washington Commanders 23-21. to 21. I'm sure the big daddy techs are on fire once oh again yesterday afternoon. The folks, they want to know, what has he been telling you about this team? To where I think at this point, does he just give up on, on the Packers? No, no, no. He, he, he still has he faith. Wants, he wants – no, he has no faith at all. He, okay. They were winning 14 to 10. He sent me a text. We're, we're, we're gonna, I said, you're not losing. He's like, yeah, we're going to lose. It, the fuck will fuck it up. And so he, here's what he said to me yesterday. This is He wants blood. He wants somebody's blood on – he wants somebody's – and he, he's not blaming Rodgers. I mean, Big Daddy is not a Rodgers blamer. He's like, okay. what's worse, the Cowboys losing at home to the Lions or the Packers losing to the condoms? He calls the Washington football team the condoms on the road. I said, but, but Big Daddy, the Packers are winning. He said, laugh out loud, not for long. And then he said, then, of course, he was happy that Matthew was winning. Are you seeing this? Green Bay sucks. I said they are. Is it coaching or personnel? I said a lot of it is coaching. I mean, the team's constructed in the wrong way. Okay, who the fuck's fault is that? Who should pay the price for that? And I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, I'm not, not in the building. I hope Rodgers leaves for a better team. Let the love fest begin. He keeps waiting for love fest. And then this is when he's the brilliant. Amari Rodgers blows. He was a second-round pick. Goot. 
with eight exclamation points, and he just wants to blame Goot. Oh, and the prize corner, Alexander, I told you, Oof. he's getting beat constantly today. Oof, Jair Alexander had a rough day guarding Terry McLaurin <laughs> yesterday. McLaurin was the best player on the field. But Big Daddy, he's got a reason to be mad about this team, and we got this tip uh, from our buddy Trip Tepper who listens to the show. He's pointed out to me on Twitter and to you as well, saying that Green Bay's second-half scoring – in the last eight games, this goes back to the playoff game against the Niners last year. Second half, three points against the Niners. Week one against the Vikings, seven points. Week two against the Bears, three points. Week three against the Bucks, zero points. Week four against the Pats, they had 20 points plus OT. Kudos to them getting that victory. And then week five against the Giants, two points. Week six against the Jets, seven points. And then yesterday against the Commanders, seven points. What's going on the with condoms. this team after halftime? Or the condoms. Well, I mean, I think, look, to me... <laughs> I, I, a lot of this, to me, comes on 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 LaFuck. I mean, like, at some point, when you knew you traded Devontae Adams and mm -hmm. that they weren't going to get you a veteran receiver who could alter the coverage, okay? You're not getting Tyreek Hill. You're not getting any of those guys. Okay. We can't do what we're doing. And for him to just constantly to ignore the running game, like to just basically say we're not going to run the ball, I mean – I mean, he didn't even try to get Aaron Jones going. He didn't even try to get A.J. Dillon going. I mean, like, they had 38 yards rushing. The last three weeks, they had 94. Against New England, he won the game. He had 199 yards rushing. Okay? So, like, he's, his offseason, he didn't spend any time saying, all right, I don't have my blue-chip player. I have a blue-chip quarterback, but I don't have a blue-chip receiver. How am I going to manufacture this offense? What do I need to do? What do I need to change? What do I need to simplify? What do I need to do to maneuver? And then what do I need to do to get better at second-half adjustments? Like, what are we doing wrong that we're not adjusting to the game? Now, how about this for a number? The Packers were 0 for 6 on third down against the condoms, okay? 0 for 6. That, that puts their total this week again. They were 4 for 16 last week. So now they're four for 22 in the last 22 third downs. They've converted four of them. And you have a legitimate blue chip quarterback and you can't convert third downs. Is it, is it players or is it scheme? I'm saying to you, this is the problem. When, you, when, you, when you're in March, you got to sit there and look at the board and say, okay, th this is what we got, right? Okay. You know the scene in Apollo 13 where they throw all that shit on the table and they say we got to make this into that using nothing but this? Mm -hmm. That is essentially describes what a head coach, general manager have to do in March. That's what we got to do. This is what we have to do. We have to turn we have we have this, we'll turn it into that. Because as Al Davis used to say to me all the time, you got to tell the high school you got to tell these these coaches, they're like high school coaches. They ain't getting any more players. So they got to work with the ones they have. Well, LaFleur wants to run the offense that he had last year with Devontae Adams, who is in Las Vegas. After the game, Aaron Rodgers did say this, Michael. He said that, quote, this might be good for us, and that this week with the Buffalo Bills on deck coming up this Sunday, he referenced how everyone's going to kind of be picking them to get blown out in the game in prime time and said, hey, maybe this will be good for us to kind of go through this sort of adversity. I mean, now it's been three straight weeks of adversity, losing to the Giants, Jets, and Commanders successively here, but... Do you think this could end up being a good thing for the Packers? Is there any optimism that they might be able to turn this around starting this week, maybe? Well, I mean, it's going to have to be a design. They're going to have to change it. I mean, they don't – look, the, nobody's going to – everybody's got a formula for how to play them now, right? I mean, so other than the New England game and the Bears game, the two games that they won, they ran the ball effectively. You know, the Tampa game, they won 14-12. Brady doesn't get the two-point play. They were fortunate. But the last four weeks – Opponents have run for 167, 125, 179, 166. Can't stop the run. I mean, they lose to the Jets. The Jets threw for 99 yards. The Jets were one for 11 on third down. I mean, you want to talk about who should hold a clinic? I think we're talking about daily coach having a clinic for head coaches. I think the LaFleur brothers should hold a clinic for third down. I think they should have, like in Kansas City, right out of ballroom and say, any coach in America who wants to improve third down, come to my clinic. Come. I'm going to teach you guys how to, how to dominate third down. I keep saying this all the time. LaFuck got the head coaching job of the Packers. He went 0 for 11 against Sir Don Wink Martindale when he was at Tennessee. He, he didn't even convert a third down there. And now him and his brother, between him and his brother, his brother was, you know, when you look at the third downs, I mean, his brother was 3 for 14 against Denver yesterday. 
and one for 11. So they're four for 25, the Jets. The Packers are four for 22. This will be a hell of a clinic. We'll have popcorn. We'll have sandwiches. We'll have everything. <laughs> we can I a- mean, it'll be a hell of a clinic. Let's come in and clinic third down. We'll get coaches from everywhere. I bet you you could sell out that bitch. I mean, those guys got jobs, so they must be selling something good. So I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, nobody says anything about it. Like, they're one of the – I mean, I give the Jets credit. Look, the Jets formula – the Jets have watched the Giants and give them credit. I'm not disputing that. Mm-hmm. But third down, at some point, the coach takes over third down. It's pretty bad for the Green Bay And Packers. if you're bad on third down, here's what I always say. If you're bad on third down, then play Canadian football. Play Canadian football. Get first downs and two downs. If you know you, you're not going to be able to convert, like when you used to play Mike Zimmer, and you were, and he would give you that double A gap mug stuff, and mm-hmm. you couldn't handle all the shit he was coming with. Okay, let's eliminate third. I mean, Kansas City sat there, said Andy Reid probably said in his in his Tuesday or Monday meeting to with his staff and said, "Look, we get in third down against this team, we're probably not going to be able to block them. So let's just convert. Let's just make our second down package." More elaborate. Let's make sure we have more play. They had nine third downs in the game. That's all they had. The Raiders did exactly the same thing. The Raiders, went, because of the way that the, the, the Texans play defense, you're not going to make explosive plays down the field. So if you get positive yards, you can convert first downs and two downs. And they did. I think they had nine third downs. It ended up being a loss for the Green Bay Packers, 23-21, to and they are, like I mentioned earlier, in a world of hurt. Michael, let's get to our last game this segment here, Browns and the Ravens. Baltimore hangs on to win it 23-20. to They tried. They really did try to. to relinquish another fourth quarter lead here, but they get the victory and proving to 4-3 and three on the season. They are now tied with Cincinnati for first place in the AFC North. I mean, they lose. Uh, Cleveland averages six yard, six-point yards per play. Baltimore averages four yards. I mean, Baltimore, I mean, I didn't understand. I didn't watch a lot of it. I was watching some of it. They didn't. Um, um, Lamar, did, he had 13 pass attempts in the game. They didn't even try to. In the fourth quarter, once again, Baltimore's got 25 plays. They get seven first down, and they turn the ball over. I mean, that was a lucky cover if you had Cleveland in the six and a half because Baltimore probably going to kick the field goal there and make it six, I'm assuming. But who could assume anything nowadays the way they go? Yeah. And look, Cleveland, once again, in the fourth quarter, they can't close it out. If I were in Cleveland, you know, one thing Stefanski has been good at doing is first quarter. And he had, you know, his first two drives, he's got, you know, he gets 10 points. Get a touchdown and a field goal. After that, you know, the second quarter, he lost the game. He had three, three and outs. He could, they couldn't move the ball. And then they put Brissett in the position at the end of the game and they can't seem to make a play. Amari Cooper got called for that. I, did you see that? I, I, I mean, he pushed off a little bit. Did you see that call? I didn't, no, I didn't see that play, no. Uh, I mean, he, he they had a touchdown to Amari Cooper, and he did push off. I mean, Peter sold it really well. Yeah. And, and you know, they pushed off, but they couldn't make a – they can't make a play. In the, once they get to a passing game and the left tackle works – I mean, he can't really I – mean, I mean, literally, literally, Justin Houston was reborn yesterday. I think he had like three sacks. He was kicking the shit out of the left tackle. But – this is what happens to Cleveland, right? I've said this a, a zillion years. When you run the Kyle Shanahan, Gary Kubiak, Mike Shanahan offense, and you get behind and you have to pass protect and drop back action, you're just not good enough at it. You just don't have enough good – you're not just good. You need play action to be successful, and that's what happened. That's why Cleveland in the fourth quarter, 17 plays, seven first downs, and they miss a 60-yard field goal. Are the Ravens good? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think I so think either. they're four. I don't think so. I, I, I think to me, you know, I mean, Cleveland ran the ball on them. I mean, Cleveland ran the ball. I think they're g- good. I mean, it, it, that, that's a great question. Are they good? I just, th- there are like a lot of teams. I think they're average, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, they threw, Femi, they won, they threw for 94 yards yesterday. They only had 17 first downs in the game. They gave up 113 yards. Now, they they forced two turnovers, they forced two turnovers, but they had 160 yard passing. I mean, so let me read you. Let me read you the Ravens passing numbers. They had 94, they had 195, they had 170 against Cincy. Buffalo they had 296. They lost that game. They made big plays against Buffalo. New England they had 394. They had uh, 206. Okay, excuse me. Against Buffalo they had 134 yards passing. 
New England, they had 206. In Miami, they had 300. I mean, they've had one 300-yard passing day. It's not a good offense, and they're lucky they have Lamar Jackson there who's been kind of keeping this thing afloat. They were able to get Gus Edwards going a little bit, but something about Baltimore, and I guess we'll find out more this upcoming Thursday when they take on the Bucks. but something seems just off about this team, and it's felt off the entire season, but they still have time to go ahead and get that corrected. Michael, let's take a break, and then on the other side, we'll get to the rest of Sunday's slate from Week 7. All right, Michael, let's get to the rest of Sunday's slate, starting with the Dallas Cowboys. They get back in the win column against the Detroit Lions, winning that game 24-6. to Dallas improves to 5-2. and two. Detroit now 1-5 and five on the season. And when you look at the box score, it was a pretty evenly played game until you go to the turnovers, which Dallas went ahead and won that 5-1. to one. Yeah, well, I mean... No, it's an evenly played game until you get to the, the, the fourth quarter. I mean, let me just give you the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter, they had they lost the game here. They, they gave up. They had 21 plays in the fourth quarter, three fumbles and an interception. That's their fourth quarter. Yeah. This is a, this is a 10 to 6 game where I don't know who got it to the one inch line, it was but they, they listed it as a touchdown. Now, you know, I mean, Detroit was six and a half was was pretty much a a sharp play all week long. It was at seven and it moved to six and a half. Mm-hmm. And every every sharp at the Borgata was on Detroit. Okay. It's a 10-6 game, 13, they score, make it 13 to 10. Pretty much you're gonna cover that, right? I yep. mean, it's it's in the fourth quarter, you're gonna cover that. Not so fast. Next play, they turn it over. And after that. Now we're looking at a 24 to 6 game. And the score isn't even as indicative. Both teams average 5.6 yards per play, right? Yeah. But the, the Detroit Lions average 0.54 points per possession. I mean, their possession chart was a disaster. And and this offense, which was humming, is no longer humming. And Goff is being Goff. He's turning the ball over. He's fumbling in the pocket. You know, he's making mistakes. And people after seven weeks have adjusted to their def- to their offense and they're not good enough to carry the defense. I mean, they're 29th in the red zone. They're 31st on th- all the situations that the head coach is supposed to handle, like Dayball's handling them, or even Salai in, in New York. The, Detroit doesn't handle them. Look, this is what happens. When you give a guy, and you're the chief executive officer of the Detroit Lions, I think his name's Rod Wood. You bring in Spielman, make all the fans happy, and then you give the head coach a six-year contract. What you're saying is, I gave him six years because I want six years. You know, like, <laughs> like, like seriously, who's judging this? You're one in five. Yeah, you were on hard knocks. Your team is horribly coached. You don't do anything good. It's interesting because I was one of those people that bet on Detroit at plus seven, and I thought that their offensive line could hold up just a little bit better against Dallas's pass rush, but we see Goff get sacked five times. You mentioned their second half, what they did. I mean, it was interception, punt, fumble, interception, fumble, fumble for their possessions in the second half. I, I thought Detroit probably should have covered the game, but I guess that's neither here nor there. Oh, Dan yeah, they Camp- cover, but I mean, but they can't cover because they keep giving them the ball. They're, yeah. You know, they the keep giving them the – how do you cover when you're going to – like that's one of the things that I've tried to do in handicap it is really look at those teams that give the ball away versus the teams that don't. You know, that that there goes your cover, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, both teams are three for nine on third down. What did you make of the Dallas offense and Dak's return? I, I didn't think – I mean, against a bad defense, to be honest with you, it against bad. the bad defense, I, I didn't think it was that – you know, I thought they played it safe. I thought they yeah. took it down the middle. They let their defense win the game. I don't think it was one of those where Dak was just going to play, oh, my God, Dak's playing great here. I think they did exactly what they needed to do to win the game. They made four big plays, none of them over 24 yards. They didn't really risk them. You know, and they were able to to create turnovers. They only had one fumble lost in the game. So, you know, when you look it over, I mean, what did they do? They they the points per points per possession, they were at 0.4. The Lions were at 0.1. I mean, when you know your opponent can't move the ball on you, are you in fact gonna really why would you risk anything? Why would you take chances? The game is the game. The strategy in the game determines how we play the game. Yeah, Mike McCarthy coached the game to win and not to put up points, and they went ahead and won 24 to 6. Now 5 and 2 with the Chicago Bears on deck this upcoming Sunday here. Michael, we also saw in Los Angeles yesterday. How about the Seattle Seahawks? The first place Seattle Seahawks in the NFC West. They improved to 4 and 3. 
beating the Chargers 37-23. to And to be honest, the score wasn't even that close. It was an wow. absolute ass-kicking on the field yesterday. And the Seahawks got whatever they wanted on the ground. Kenneth Walker, my goodness, what a breakout performance. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you to start the show. Mm-hmm. Brennan Staley's supposed to be, he was what, pro football focuses last year, he's the best coach. We have people on our network that thought he was the greatest coach ever, right? Last yep. year, we have people that have guests on our network that think he's the greatest coach ever. Can you explain to me what makes him great? Now, you say, well, you know, his def- he's a defensive no. genius. No, he's not. He's a defensive genius, right? <laughs> no, he's not. I mean, has anybody paid attention to his geniusness on defense? Like, you can't be, when Nick Saban coached the 94 94- Cleveland Browns on defense. The longest run we gave up that year was 21 yards, 29 yards. Okay. That was the longest run. I mean, the three of the last four, three, three of two of the last three weeks, they've given up over 213 yards on the ground. I mean, Cleveland made an explosive play. Seattle makes them like, at what point do we stop the rhetoric goes for it on fourth down, turns the ball over. doesn't help the right. to. I mean, I, I, they've got a good team. Man, I'm telling you what, yeah. it, it, it's they're hard to watch. It's it's hard to defend the guy. It's really hard, and I don't I don't hate them. They averaged four eight per play. They gave up against Seattle six point four yards per play. The Seahawks got whatever they wanted, and Brandy Saley, you mentioned his defense. It, it's been bad, and it's been bad since last year. He was brought in to be a defensive guy. He made his name off of being the coordinator of a defense that was led by Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey. And now that he doesn't have those players, his defense is getting lit on fire here. On the Seattle side, though, Michael, Geno Smith, I know is a guy that you've talked about, have a lot of, had a lot of praise for Geno. 20 of 27, 210 passing yards, two TDs, one interception from Smith. As long as he's playing like this, that defense is starting to get a little bit better. They have a lot of young guys back there. My man Tariq Woolen back there on that defense. If the Seahawks can play a little bit better defensively, is this a team that can legitimately win the NFC West? I mean, look, I don't know. They got some injuries in the game. I don't know what yes. their injury situation is this week. I know they lost a tackle, and, and, and I saw DK yep. and Metcalf was hurt too. But, I mean, give John Schneider credit. Give Pete Carroll. I mean, look, Pete Carroll's a really good coach. He's going in the Hall of Fame. Whatever people want to say about Pete Carroll, you could say it. But the guy got his team ready to play, and and, and they've been able to do this with a quarterback that, None of us thought. I, I think Geno's playing really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marquise Goodwin, they pick him up off the hip, hip, off the off the heap, and he comes in there, gives them explosive plays. And like you said, I think this defense is really improving. I mean, they got after the quarterback yesterday. They had six sacks last week, you know, and this week they and this week they go in there and they I think they had three they had three and a half sacks or or, or something like that this week. I mean, they were they were getting after the quarterback. I mean, Herbert had a hard time throwing the football. Yeah, I, I thought Seattle had a, an excellent game plan, and they looked really good. And that's a team that, in a weak NFC, uh, they might be able to go uh, ahead and make the All I hear about is, is the Chargers have pro bowlers on every level. Nah. They have pro bowlers on every level. You know, the defense, you know, I mean, J.C. Jackson hurts his knee. Yes. You know, and, and he's going to be out for the year. Will he ever be the same? I mean, everybody in New England was worried about his knee. I mean, that was a concern. I said this on this podcast before. And now he just now he has hyperextends his knee, has dislocated kneecap. I don't want the kid to get hurt, but that that wasn't a good signing. Samuel's not nobody in their secondary plays well. Derwin James, I mean, they have all these Pro Bowlers and nobody plays good. At some point, when does somebody say, "Wait a minute, when do we start playing good? When do we start playing good?" The issue is that their software counts, and that's on the trenches. That's the problem. Is if I mean, he's supposed to be this guru. He's supposed to fix it, right? He's supposed. That's why they hired him. They got a really good offense, so they wanted to hire a deep. I mean, we make fun of it's like to me what's happening at A and M. Everybody makes fun of Kevin Sumlin, <laughs> and Jimbo's worse. Everybody made fun of poor Anthony Lynn. This guy's worse than Anthony Lynn. They play better yeah. with Anthony Lynn. They definitely did, Michael. Let's keep it moving here. The AFC South. Someone's going to have to win that division, and it's probably going to be the Tennessee Titans. They're now four and two, winning four straight games. They beat the Colts nineteen to ten, and I tweeted it yesterday. How the hell do the Titans keep getting away with this, man? <laughs> 4.5 yards per play, 254 total yards. Tannehill looked like a disaster out there. He got banged up with the foot injury, but score one again for Mike Vrabel. I mean, look, when you have t- the Colts had 10 drives in the game, they had five punts, four turnovers. I mean, <laughs> I mean, so think bad. about it, right? This is two times in a row. This is two times in a row they play twice. 
the Colts didn't score in the first half in either either ten. They didn't score, and they turned the ball over. And Tennessee just hangs around, picks six for a touchdown. It's difference in the game, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you turn the ball over. I mean, I mean, look, they had three plays all in the twenties, explosive plays. Indianapolis can't make an explosive play. They have one play for twenty yards, explosive play. You keep the ball in front of you. You don't let them run the ball with any consistency. You pressure the quarterback, let him make mistakes. I mean, Tennessee's going to win the South. They're not the best team. If Mike Frable and Doug Peterson changed, Tennessee would probably have the first pick in the draft, and and ten, and, and Jacksonville probably would be, you know, five, what would be one of the better teams. Frable knows who his team is, and that's probably the best sign of a coach right there. He continuously, and we talk about it every single offseason, this guy goes over their regular season win total every single it's year. Remarkable. And we just keep doubting him every single year because when you look on paper, this team is not good. And when you watch them, they're, they're not good either. <laughs> no, they're ugly to watch. I mean, I can't imagine the, the the other than Titan fans that you really actually like watching them play. It's horrible. It's, uh, it's an ugly win. They're ugly, but they play. Yeah. And they play effectively. I mean, they play. They play. They keep the guy the ball out of the end zone. They know who they are, like you said. You know, they let you make mistakes. They don't make very many of them. They don't care if they only throw for 106. Think about this now. Think about this. The last five games, okay, against Buffalo, they threw for 107 yards. Okay, against the Raiders, they threw for 252 all in the first half mostly. Indianapolis, they throw for 116. Washington, they throw for 136. And again, against Indy, they throw for another 116, and they win the game. And they now have a two-game lead on the Colts there in that division, getting the season sweep there. Uh, Michael, we saw the New York Jets also win ugly yesterday afternoon in the Rocky Mountains. They beat the Broncos 16-9. to Brett Rippon got the start there for Denver with Russell Wilson out with the hamstring injury. Rippon went 24-46, 225, an interception. Zach Wilson, 16-26 of 26 for 121. But, boy, there are some reps there that I've seen on circulating on Twitter from Zach Wilson that looked absolutely horrific, but that defense – Played well once again. Robert Sala's team now 5-2, and 4-0 and oh away from the Meadowlands. Really impressive stuff from the Jets. Look, they, that, that was a game they had to win, and they did. I, I, I gave it out as one of my plays on the show, and Patrick said to me, said, are you sure you want to do that? Because he knows what I think <laughs> about the Jets. And I'm like, look, if they don't win this game, if they can't beat Rippon there, with especially as bad as the, as the, uh, the Broncos are offensively, in terms of details mm-hmm. and attention to detail and all that, I mean, like, why not? And so this is two weeks in a row now. We, we've seen the Jets win games that they really have done nothing. They made one explosive play. They had the big run, you know, and, and they don't turn the ball over. Yep. They kept, they've kept, they basically have told Zach Wilson, you are not allowed to participate in this game. The last time he's really played in a game was in the fourth quarter against Pittsburgh. They threw for 250 in that game. Since that game, 187, 99, and 105. And, and what makes it even more alarming is the fact that they're, they're in the last two weeks, they're 11 for 25. They're, they're, they're four for 25 on third down. So he'll be, you know, we'll have, we'll, have my, we'll have Matt do the beginning of the clinic, and then Mike will come in and do the second part of the clinic on third down offense, and we could have this will be just sensational how we can do it. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. That, that LaFleur think combination. I mean, think about this. We talk about the Miami Dolphins to start the show about how explosive they are and all that. I mean, th- th- they've won games. At least the Jets know who the hell they are. They're not going to let their quarterback mm-hmm. beat them. They've had no turnovers since the second qu- since the second and third quarter against Pittsburgh. No turnovers. And they're plus four in turnover takeaway. Jets get the win, but unfortunately it came at a cost. Brees Hall, their star rookie running back. Robert Sala after the game said it's likely an ACL. I'm sure we'll get confirmation later on today, but a bummer there for the New York Jets because Brees Hall looked awesome. You mentioned the explosive touchdown run that he had, uh, so hopefully it's a speedy recovery for the rookie out of Iowa State. Uh, Michael, earlier in the day we saw the Cincinnati Bengals beat the Atlanta Falcons 35-17. Bengals now 4-3. and three. Joe Burrow starting to look like Joe Burrow, 3 3- uh, 34 for 42, 481, and three touchdowns. Are we sleeping on Cincinnati, Michael? Well, this is the first week that we saw Cincinnati make explosive plays, right? Yeah. They had 10 plays in the game that were over 20 yards. You know, they had a they had a 60-yard touchdown, a 41-yard touchdown. They had a 32-yard touchdown. I mean, they made explosive plays. And when they do that, and when Atlanta can't stay attached to you, 
It's you over. know, because what they threw it 13 times in the game. I mean, Atlanta didn't even have an interest in throwing. They don't want Mariota to participate. They want him to run. But Atlanta's got to win the game a certain way. And, and look, Zach Taylor tried now at the end of the half, right? The end of the <laughs> half, they get that three points. I guess re- punt the ball out of bounds. Just tell your punter, punt it out of bounds. Mm. Punt the ball out of bounds. I don't care where it goes. Just make sure it goes out of bounds so they can't return it. That's managing the game. I mean, think about it. They averaged 8.1 yards per play in this game. They averaged, they averaged 3.88 points per possession. Man, it was an explosive performance there for Cincinnati, who will now be taking on the Cleveland Browns next Monday night. Final game, Michael, we got to get to the Las Vegas Raiders. Went ahead and beat the Houston Texans 38-20. to It was competitive for three quarters, but then yeah. the Raiders really exploded there in the fourth. I mean, it was a. I thought Houston was going to cover. I really did, uh, and mm-hmm. it was a game they they should have covered. It's twenty four to twenty, uh, late in the fourth quarter, and they've got a third. They've got a fourth in inches, and and they don't they don't convert it. They they false start, so they've got a punt. The Raiders never had field position the entire. The Raiders' best field position was the twenty nine yard line, their own twenty nine. They had four drives of over 70 yards in the game. And again, they only were in third down nine times. So they manufactured, they, they were very good. They kept getting positive yards. The last five possessions of the game, they scored on all of them. And once they got the two score lead, then Davis Mills threw the pick six mm-hmm. and they made Houston play outside the comfort zone. I mean, Houston's the, it, it, Houston is a 50 minute team down to the stretch, partly because two of the design. Right, Lovey wants smaller guys. He wants to play fast. And when you watch him in the first quarter, they're really good. But when you watch him in the fourth quarter, they're worn down. They're not the same team. They don't have enough physicality and enough physical size to hold up. And the Raiders kept pounding the rock. I'm telling you now, I'm telling you this, I'm keep saying it. If you're a two-back run team, you have a distinct advantage in the National Football League right now because none of these teams know how to fit on two-back runs. None of them do. The Raiders just – I mean, Josh Jacobs is sensational. Oh, man. But he's got holes to run in because they don't know how to fit on two back. Everything's one back, read, option, run. And they don't know how to fit it. Josh Jacobs, 20 carries, 143, three touchdowns. This is coming in a contract year. He's going to be a free agent this coming March, man, and he is having a career season. Uh, So shout-out to Josh Jacobs for that performance. When it started off a little rocky with him getting eight carries in the Hall of Fame game, now he's the engine for this Raiders offense. Michael, let's take our final break. On the other side, we'll do awards and then get to Monday Night Football. My man Justin Fields against your guy, Bill Belichick. (laughs) All right, Michael, before we get out of here, we got to hand out some hardware for the awards. The Fred Palermo Game Plan of the Week, who is that going to? Well, I'm going to give it to the the Carolina Panthers. I mean, 13 point dogs in the game. They trade McCaffrey. You know, everybody says they're tanking for the first pick of the draft, and they come out and play smart. They, they they don't turn the ball over. PJ Walker. I mean, the guy the guy was really good. You know, he was really good in the game. He made some great throws, and they and they beat the Bucks. Twenty. They hold them to three points. They win the game 21 to three. So they play within themselves. This was the first time when they were out in Los Angeles last week. They didn't let PJ really play in the game. Like they kept throwing bubbles. You know, I think if they'd have let him play in the game, they might have beaten the Rams that day because they were up 10 to three at the half, I think, or 10 to six, and they they had the the pick six off Stafford. But then the the second half kind of fell apart. So I, I think to me. I think to me that they deserve it. I mean, it's a hell of a win for Steve Wilkes and the coaching staff. They, they've done a good job, and I was happy for them. Who's going on the lamb this week? We got a lot of candidates. We got a lot. But, <laughs> a I mean, lot. look, the Bucks. I mean, look, the Bucks and the Brat Packers, either they figure out why they're losing. It's just not going to be turned on a switch. They're just not going to turn it on. And you only have so many pieces to work with, right? You only have so many players to work with. And so you've got to figure out what we do well, what we don't do well, and let's condense this. Let's get to basic football, and let's try to execute for the Bucs. Let's stop the run. Let's get our run defense better. You know, let's force them into where we can create some turnovers with our blitz package. And offensively, let's find some way where we could stop having Brady throw the ball 50 times. If you don't know, now you know. Well, I think there's two things that we learned this weekend. Philly, Kansas City, and Buffalo are by far the best teams. I mean, San Francisco, I thought, could challenge, and maybe they will when they get their defense, but their defense can't play like they did yesterday. So I have hope for San Francisco, but it waned. It was very disappointing watching Kansas City dominate them. And so to me, those three teams, it's a little bit like college football. I think there's Ohio State, 
and, and I think there's Georgia, and then I think there's a separation. Then there's Alabama, yeah. and then I think there's another separation, right? And so maybe it's Alabama, Tennessee, then another separation. Well, I think this is a little bit like that too. I think you got those three teams, and then you got a bunch of teams led by San Francisco in this cluster, you know. And you've got surprise teams like Seattle. How do you know they're first place? The Giants, right? The Jets. <laughs> You know, so I, I think to me, the thing is, what we also think we've learned after seven weeks, if you don't make stupid mistakes and you manage your players and you have the right design for your team, you can win games. Tennessee's living proof of that. The Giants are proof of that. So are the Jets. We need to have a heart to heart. And I think it might come this upcoming Thursday on the Kansas City Chiefs because I, I don't know if I'm quite there just yet. Putting them in the group with with Buffalo and Philadelphia. I don't think I can put Look, them there hey, quite yet. I don't know why you can't. They played Buffalo as well as they could. They yeah. they they got the ball with the last set to play. Now he throws throws an interception. Look, I think to me the way quarterbacking plays going Femi in this league, mm -hmm. how bad it is. How bad the coaching's been going. That when you get a coach and a quarterback, I think you might want to stay with it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I I just I don't fear that team. Without Tyreek Hill, I don't think that they're the scary team they once were. Uh, in the final award, the David Ogilvie, who's the fraud of the week? I mean, come on. I mean, at some point, <laughs> when are we going to stop with the Staley conversation? Like, is, when is somebody going to say, hey, Brendan, I know you go for it on fourth down. That's your signature dish. You know, but you don't <laughs> even cook that good. I don't know why we would go to your restaurant for that dish, but I know it's your signature dish. But it's, when is your defense going to play better? And, and at some point, when's Doug Peterson going to figure out that I shouldn't be going for it? I should take field goals. Like, he hasn't been as successful on fourth down as he was going back to 17. Like, put a new album out. Put a new album out. You know, like, get something new out there. Like, we can't listen to Frampton Comes Alive every week. A, like, put a new album out. It's a one-hit one. -hit I know you won a Super Bowl, but at some point, like, modify the team. You know, it's like you didn't watch season three of The Sopranos, but it's like when Tony calls all the Goombas together and he says, look, the, the business, the receipts are going down, and our business is time and memorial. You know, we're recession-proof. It's us and the, uh, and the entertainment industry. Like, at some point, when do you have that meeting? Like, the problem is nobody's holding the coaches accountable for these stupid mistakes. Like, could you imagine if Mike McDaniel did what he did and he had to go face Al Davis on Monday morning with that? Well, first of all, he would have waited till Monday morning. His ass would have been in there on s Sunday, Sunday night. Yeah. I mean, like, at some point, who's who's – like, is Rod Wood holding Dan Campbell accountable for what he's doing? Or is somebody helping Dan Campbell? Hey, Dan, maybe we ought to think about doing this. This is what they hired Spielman for, who's never had any practical experience in it. Like, maybe you need to help Dan Campbell become a head coach. Like, that's what I'm saying. Once the, once the LaFleur third down clinic's over, I think the Daily Coach should have a how-to-help-head-coaches-be-head-coaches clinic. All right, Michael. We got to wrap things up with the Monday night football game. And this one it might be a tough night for my guy. Chicago Bears at the New England Patriots. The Patriots over at our show sponsored DraftKings. Eight point favorites. Total sitting at 40. But who's playing QB for New England? Because we heard that Mac Jones practice all week long. But there hasn't been an, an announcement and nothing official as of yet. <laughs> I don't think we'll get one. I don't think he's going <laughs> to let tip his hand. He doesn't have to. You know, all he's got to yeah. do is give the injury report. I would suspect it's back. It wouldn't shock me if it's Bailey Zappi. I mean, look, they're, they're going to play a certain way. They're going to not lose the game. You know, Belichick's sitting there saying, okay, we've got to force a negative play. This is the approach you got to play. You play Chicago. We've got to force a negative play. We've got to do a really good job controlling him in the quarterback. In, in the, we've got to see him as a runner first and, and a receiver. We're going to make sure we don't give up the big play down the field because he can throw the nine route good. And then we've got to be able to protect the football and not turn it over. And – and get to the red zone and not kick field goals. If we can get a two-point score lead on this team and force him to participate, we'll win the game. I think it'll be a little bit closer. I think the Bears will play hard. They do. Mm -hmm. You know, I think New England's going to try to run the ball. They're going to play a certain way that's conducive to kind of allowing Chicago to cover. I think, I think the Patriots win. I think it'll be a good game. And we mentioned it in the last podcast, but it, it is worthy of being mentioned once again here. Bill Belichick has the chance to pass George Hallis and move into second all-time on the NFL wins list, currently tied at 324. So and, and you know, I can say this. He, between him, I think Pete Carroll, Andy Reid, and Bill are proving the point that experience matters. I think yeah. they're proving the point experience matters. I think you can go out and hire all these inexperienced guys you want, but when you get an inexperienced guy against an experienced guy like Don Martindale, Sir Don Martindale, you're going to lose. I mean, just like the guy at Cincinnati, 
you know, Lou Amaromo, he, you know, nobody, his, he, he's an experienced guy. Dan Quinn, exp, experience does matter. Like it really does. It's becoming obvious and inexperience. And of course, if you're labeled a genius, you don't have to worry about anything. It's like, you know, it's like if you, you know, if you show up to, it's like George Costanza. If I just leave my car here, people think I get to work early. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> and uh, just go to the Ivy League school and they'll hire you as a head coach there. But uh, Michael, I think we both think the Patriots win this game. I think it doesn't really need to go into that one much. Is it, you think New England wins? Yeah, I do, but I think it's going to be a close game. Okay. I think New England's not a team. I know they blew out Detroit because Goff turned the ball over, but New England's not a team. The New England's got to wear you down. New England's got to body punch you. New England's got to get the game to the fourth quarter. New England's he's going to get control of the game at some point. He's not trying to win the game in the first quarter, right? Nobody wins mm-hmm. the game in the first quarter, so you have to coach your team. It's like, you know, I was talking to my son about the Texans, like, like uh, you know, when they're playing, you you're not going to beat the Texans in the first quarter. They're they're gonna they're, you got to wear them down. You got to keep playing the game, and you got to and what you have to do is prepare your team that there's no that they're, they're going to have to. This game will be in the fourth quarter because everybody's talking like it's going to be a blowout. So that 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 messaging gets into your players' head. Whereas you got to look. This game's going to the fourth quarter, fellas. We're going to have to win it in the fourth quarter, and here's how we're going to win it. All right. Well, hopefully it's entertaining tonight over there in Foxborough. That does it for us. Thank you to DraftKings and Veasan as always. Thank you to our producer Stephen Bond, who's and, with and, us and, and on the Femi, ones and two. We, yep. As we're thanking people, we'll let them know about the third down clinic that I think we'll hold it <laughs> yes. in Kansas City to get more people in. Is that going to be and the off season? We'll, 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 the off season, we'll have okay. it in March in Kansas City, and then we'll have the clinic for coaches some probably in Atlanta for the Daily Coach Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure that Matt LaFleur and Michael Four can, can get out there. Oh, they're going to uh, lead it. They're yeah, going to lead, lead the third it. down clinic. Yeah, There we go. So make sure to look out for that and see where you can subscribe and uh, sign up and register for that uh, that daily coaching clinic. But uh, thank you, as always, to all the listeners. Subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll talk to you guys on Thursday. Thanks for watching the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi. And for more videos like this, make sure to subscribe to VSIN Live and the GM Shuffle podcast with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN, wherever you get your podcasts.